Welcome to the third and final event in the series of Curating Institutional Change for the Future Curators Programme. I'm Maiden Mosby, a white middle-aged male with white hair, a white beard and black glasses. For today's event, we have yet another amazing panel. We've got Morag Ballantyne, who's been the project evaluator, Aman Prud Sandhu, independent curator, Richard Sandell from the Museum Studies at Leicester, and Mike Laywood, director of DASH. This event also includes the launch for the next cohort of institutional hosts for the Future Curators Programme with DASH, MEMA, Mac Birmingham and Wising Arts. But first, a brief context and some housekeeping. The Future Curators Programme supports deaf and disabled curators to develop their skills and expertise through residencies within our organisations. Through the programme, we aim to change the culture of the visual arts sector so it becomes more inclusive and accessible for disabled people. Since 2018, DASH has worked with partners, MAC, Midland Arts Centre, Birmingham, MEMA, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, and Wising Arts Centre in Cambridge to develop the Future Curators programme. Just to be aware that this session is being recorded and will be available afterwards. We have British Sign Language provided by Rachel Radford and Linda Bruce. We also have live captioning by Joanne Petrie. Captions can be turned on or off by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And there's also a link if you want to see them in the browser. We're really keen to get your questions in for the panel. So please use the Q&A box to post your questions and not the chat function. But also please use the chat function to interact with your fellow attendees because it's nice to get a sense of who's in the room. So we encourage you to post your name, role, organisation if you're attached to one in the chat. Again, this is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. I'll pose as many of your questions as I can to the panel towards the end of the discussion. I'm going to ask each of the panellists to respond to the provocation in turn for five minutes. And then this will be followed by some questions from me and then opening it up to the floor. It would be great if you could take also the time to fill out the feedback form. So today we're exploring outside in, inside out internal change. How active inclusive organisational change can enrich the day-to-day -day life within an organisation or institution? And if we can use the hashtag future curators. So to start us off today, we have Morag Ballantyne. Over to you, Morag. Thank you, and, and it's lovely to be here this afternoon. I'm Morag Ballantyne. I'm a white Scottish woman in my late 50s with short blonde hair. I'm wearing a dress with white polka dots with a black background, and I'm speaking to you from my home office in West Yorkshire. I'm a freelance consultant working with artists and organizations on organizational development and change, evaluation, and coaching and mentoring. I've for living and working in Northamptonshire for 15 years and I'm now based in Yorkshire. I'm a trustee of the Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh and I'm the chair of the Real Junk Food Project, a food waste redistribution charity based in Leeds and I have two grown-up children. As one of the evaluators of curatorial commissions along with Ashok Mystery, I want to share some of the emerging learning and perspective from the programme and some of the ways in which inclusive organisational change has created benefits. But first I was thinking about what it means to be a gatekeeper. It's a word we discussed quite a lot during the programme. Aidan, Anna Berry at Mac and Hannah Wallace in her role at Wising have talked about the difference and the challenges in their roles as curators in residence as they became gatekeepers. What did it mean for how they operated and influenced change? A gatekeeper is someone whose job it is to open and close a gate, to prevent people from entering without permission, who has the power to decide who gets particular resources and opportunities and who does not. Being a gatekeeper also means having influence over other people's behaviour. And I would argue that to open the gate and commit to inclusive change requires empathy. Often we don't see things as they are, we see things how we are. 
Anthropologist Gillian Tett in her book, Anthrovision, How Anthropology Can Influence Life and Business, says the nature of leadership means you rise up, think you have power and box yourself in. Without empathy, you fail to learn about yourself. We need to listen with an open mind. And we all know that re-evaluating structures to include greater diversity means a broader range of views and experiences can be shared and built upon, leading to better, more informed decision-making. But why do we find it so hard to achieve in our organisations? I feel as though I've been talking about it for 30 years and that feels shameful. Diverse voices need to be heard, but it's what we do that matters. And in many ways, we're all complicit. As we reopen our organisations and our institutions, how are we really committing to doing things differently? Rather than being gatekeepers, Dash, Mac, Mima and Wising have opened the gate and asked, what can we share? There's enough food for everyone at the table. No one needs to go hungry or to lose out because we've invited another guest. The aim of curatorial commissions, now future curators, is to change the culture of the visual arts sector by having more deaf and disabled curators in positions of influence. But what we have learned is that there is no one way to deliver a curatorial commission's residency. They have been as individual as the institutions, the curators and the respective needs of both. What is a constant is the shared commitment to change institutionally and in the sector. The three curators have explored how to be a different kind of gatekeeper, sharing power and agency and modelling the change they and partners want to see. We also learned that institutional change doesn't have to be scary or difficult. It means changing our mindsets and behaviours, understanding what it looks and feels like to stand in each other's shoes. It starts with intent and really committing to sharing your power and resources. It starts with the quality of your invitation and welcome. This ensures people feel that they belong and when we belong, we want to contribute. So our teams become more cohesive and able to work together more powerfully. It looks like attention to access needs and auditing the accessibility of your organization. Support for access to work if needed. Not expecting the disabled curator to be the expert on access and being open to the challenge about the changes we need to make to welcome deaf and disabled colleagues. It means accessible recruitment processes, making sure learning is distributed across the whole team. And as buildings closed last year for obvious reasons, this needed even more commitment to put learning into action and it wasn't always easy. Addressing the culture of overworking in our sector, taking account of the needs of all our people, exploring patterns of work and organisational culture, being more flexible, slowing down, taking account of mental health and to happier and more productive organisations. And we need to understand that people have multiple identities and needs at work. I might be disabled and a parent and a carer and a person of colour and so on. And my needs will change over time. The programme demonstrated that when you're truly committed to institutional change, you enact it together within a framework of respect, communication and care. And it takes time and effort. The impact of the curators has made organisations rethink norms and behaviours. Having the opportunity and the time to reflect means we have learned a lot about why we do what we do, about our processes and structures. We have also recognised that all this work needs constant reviewing and reflecting because the context will keep changing. So as we develop our manifesto for inclusive change, let the gatekeeper be the person who welcomes us in. And to paraphrase Tony Benn's famous five questions about democracy, let's keep asking ourselves, what power do I have? Where did I get it from? In whose interests am I exercising it? To whom am I accountable? In what circumstances should I stop what I'm doing or, or step away? Curatorial commissions and committing to inclusive change is not a project. This is life. 
It has to be embedded in our strategy for the long haul. So let's keep the gate open. Thank you, Morag. Nice uh, keeping to time there as well. And it's amazing how many things that you said have been reiterated uh, in other panels as well about care and empathy. But, uh, you know, a really powerful start about the role of the gatekeepers. Thank you. So next up, we have Richard Sandell. So Richard, if you could introduce yourself before you start and then take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Aidan. And hi, everybody. It's great to be here. My name is Richard Sandell. I'm co-director of the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester. Um, I'm a white cisgender man in my mid 50s and I'm joining you today from uh, home office, my home office in Nottingham. Could I have the slides up, please, Joe? So my talk today, very briefly, uh, is called With Not For. Um, and it explores, looks back over a series of projects I've been involved with for um, 20 plus years to look at what happens when disabled people are in charge, just how different things can be. So we know how to make genuinely equitable museum experiences. We know how to tell stories of disability ethically in ways that engage everyone and which counter prejudices. But despite this, the UK museum landscape is full of museums that offer disabled visitors a less than experience. Very often disabled people can get into at least some of our museum spaces. They can access some of the collections and programmes on offer, but at every turn in ways large and small, their experience is diminished. Very rarely, if ever, do disabled people find cultural spaces where they are not made to feel like second-class citizens. I think there are probably many reasons for this, but one of the most significant I want to suggest is that disabled people are rarely given the agency, the power to make decisions. But when disabled people are in charge, the outcomes can be very different indeed. Next slide, please. Back in the mid 1990s, when I was working at Nottingham Castle Museum and Art Gallery, we set up the UK's first disability consultative group. Uh, you can see on the slide here, the, um, the museum is on the top of a very steep hill in the middle of the centre. And on the right uh, is the group, they were called the Drawbridge Group, uh, a small group of paid consultants, disabled people, who could support the museum as it went through a multi-million pound refurbishment to be as fully accessible as possible. The key feature of this group, however, is that we didn't simply consult. We gave the group the power to approve or reject plans for a series of new galleries. And it made a very big difference to give them that power of veto. Next slide, please. So fast forward a few years and at the University of Leicester, driven by the absence of stories of disability in museums, we carried out the first substantive investigation of UK collections to find out what material they held that could tell stories and attest to the lives of disabled people. The slide here shows a whole range of different images, objects made by, owned by, depicting disabled people. But a number of institutions, including one well-known national art gallery in London, returned our survey claiming that they had no relevant material related to disability in their collections. Sure enough, we sent in our disabled research researchers and there were numerous items that were there that were made, owned by or depicted disabled people. It just took that uh, expertise that comes from lived experience to see them and to identify them. Next slide, please. Building on a range of projects, we turned our attention to medical museums in around 2015, and we worked with a range of artists. Here you have Matt Fraser digging into the collections at the Science Museum on the left, uh, and on the right, 
um, a great image of a performance by Deaf Men Dancing. We also worked with uh, Julie McNamara, David Heavey, uh, Tony Heaton, Francesca Martinez on uh, the kind of suite of creative projects. But again, the key feature, rather than simply handing over the museum to those disabled artists for a period of time, we utilize the idea of the trading zone a space in which different forms of expertise can come together in a non-hierarchical setting to generate new insights and narratives. And this way of working proved enormously powerful in not only engaging the public and indeed medical professionals in rethinking our negative attitudes towards disability, but helped to set new standards for museum interpretation moving forward. Next slide, please. A final example uh, comes from the Welcome Collection. Uh, the image on the left shows uh, a gallery called Being Human that opened uh, September 2019 at the Welcome Collection in London. And the image on the right shows a woman um, in a wheelchair looking at some of the exhibits in that gallery. Um, we were approached uh, a couple of years before that gallery opened by Claire Barlow. She was then curator at the Welcome Collection and invited us to work with them on this new gallery that would be in place for 10 years. And our challenge was considerable, given that for many disabled people, medical museums are the last place on earth they would choose to visit. What would it take to radically reconfigure the relationship between the Welcome Collection and disabled visitors? To address this, again, we place disabled people at the heart of a sustained process, not a one-off consultation, but this sustained process of dialogue and exchange through which new ambitions, new commitments to equity were fostered and embedded in the gallery. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just very briefly, it's such a lovely example and one I've used before. Tony Heaton, who was part of our team, expressed his frustration at the convention in galleries where benches are beautifully centrally placed in front of video artworks. Um, and that central placement of the bench ensures that he's pushed to the margin symbolically, can never occupy that prized central position to look at the artwork. So the team and the welcome simply pushed the, uh, the benches to the side and took account of that lived experience of disability in shaping a gallery that works really hard to ensure that disabled people are not second-class citizens. My last slide, please. Just a, a final point about what can really happen when you put disabled people in charge. This is a headline from the New York Times that asked, is this the world's most accessible museum? It's a, a bit of a big claim and it, it may or may not be true, but interestingly, the numbers of disabled visitors in that first few months before lockdown was about 12% of visitors self-identified as disabled against 5% amongst other benchmarked institutions. And just begins to show the real impact we can have for everybody when we give and empower disabled people to make decisions. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. And just to be clear that um, Richard had asked for a little bit of extra time because he was audio describing some of those images. I haven't just um, let it drift. Um, just OK, so we've changed interpreter and now I'm going to ask Mike to speak. So if you can just do an introduction, Mike, and then you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm usually not muted. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aidan. So I'm a older white Jewish man, not a lot of hair, glasses with black frames and a black and white shirt. Um, I'm artistic director of Dash. I've been in this role for the last 22 years. And my background was as a multi-form artist working in as a musician, a puppeteer and a carnival artist. So um, I had a dream, or was it a nightmare? I went to sleep last night and I had a dream, or was it a nightmare? 
I was walking up to an imposing art building and at the front of the building, there were two people with clipboards and smiles on their faces. They approached me. Welcome to our gallery. We pride ourselves in being fully inclusive. Everyone is welcome here. You must know that we follow the Arts Council strategy, let's create. So we just need you to fill in a few details in our monitoring form and survey form so we know who is visiting our space. It will only take us a few minutes. So they asked me details about my gender, about my sexual orientation, about my ethnicity, about my disability. And when I told them that I self-defined as a self-disabled person, they got very excited. So then they asked me, am I a deaf person with a capital or a small d? Or am I hard of hearing? Or am I visually impaired? Or am I blind? Or am I partially sighted? Or am I a dribbler? Did you just ask me if I'm a dribbler? No, 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 no. Are you neurodivergent? We wouldn't ask you that. So what is your impairment? Well, I have a twist in my spine. I felt everything is getting very, very medical model here. They looked at each other. Well, I'm really sorry, but we've got two of those visiting today. So we've filled our inclusivity quote around that for this day. So if we let you in, you would put things out of balance. So why don't you come back tomorrow? I could feel a rant coming on. And then everything started to change in my dream. And I was in a dance studio. You know that sort of space, a long mirror down one side, shiny wooden floor, a bit echoey and a bit scary. Someone in a leotard came springing up to me. Hello, hello, and welcome, welcome to our very inclusive dance company. Everyone is so welcome and everyone is included. Do join in. Whatever you do is fine with us. We love to include everyone. That's why we are so inclusive. Now, the piece we're working on at this time is with our two wonderful leading dancers, Roger and Claire. They were our main dancers. They trained at Laban and Rambert. And aren't they marvelous? We're all such a beautiful backdrop for them when they're dancing together. I could feel myself starting to froth at the mouth and a scream growing in my chest. Help, get me out of here. Then everything changed again. And I was in this beautiful room with high ceilings, lovely decor. It said high status. It was a ballroom and I seemed to be in an interview. One man invited me to sit down at one end of a long table where four people sat at the other end. Now, we liked your application to be the next chair of the British Museum. You ticked all the inclusivity boxes, but we're really sorry to tell you that this role has been given to a more experienced candidate. Whew. And then I woke up. So that was all about inclusivity, which is a very complex word and not to be used lightly. In fact, it's a word that I rarely use because whom decides whom is included in our inclusivity? Equality is much more than treating everyone equally because ableism, which is closely linked to racism, must be confronted before true equality can happen. And those two examples, not the British Museum, because obviously I didn't get invited to an interview there, but the dance company and the monitoring form, that monitoring form related to quite a long battle that disability arts companies had with the Arts Council when they changed the monitoring. And it pushed everyone in the art sector to use the same monitoring because you want to align yourself with the same process that the Arts Council are using. It felt like we were being pushed back into a very medical model of, of going through those monitoring. And that did, has changed, thank God, so that's brilliant. And I won't name the company, but there certainly is a company, not that far, somewhere in the Midlands, who clearly the disabled people in that inclusive dance company are a beautiful backdrop for their wonderful, highly trained dancers from the main ballet company. Oops, I'm nearly giving me away. So um, that's called inclusive, but to my mind, it's just a sham. And so I think we really need to think carefully when we use that word. Thank you, Aidan. Gosh. <laughs> as cynical as ever, Mike. Thank you, but really, you know, powerful in in yeah. Um, 
there's a few points that I'd like to come back to on that. Just on that point, the Q&A, if you can start and get some of your questions and answers, questions, and hopefully the panel will provide the answers into, the, into that and not the chat function, then that would be great. Thank you. So for our final presenter, it's over to uh, Aman Brit Sandhu. Thanks, so, Aidan. Yeah, thank um, you. My name's Aman Preet. I'm um, a female South Asian um, in her 40s. I have black hair with flecks of grey and I'm wearing a black top and sitting um, behind a suite of wardrobes in West London. Um, Mike's made me think now a lot about language. Um, I have a script where I do use access and inclusion um, quite a bit, so bear with me um, while I read this out. Um, what creates a culture of gatekeeping and has led to access and inclusion being a secondary concern? Or a concern that only becomes a matter of urgency when there is a rupture or call for change from outside of the institution? Maybe we should start from a position that the work we are involved in and what this work is will be slightly different for everyone and the mechanism of many of the organisations we work at or with are still inherently elitist and hierarchical in their very structure. In this way, the power, organisational and administrative structures of cultural organisations are at, are at odds with the work that needs to be done and achieved for access and inclusion and welcoming a wider constituency. In turn, this conversation cannot be separated from how programming is and has been conceived in some, but not all, cultural organisations, which is with one eye on what professional peers and taste makers are supporting in terms of artists and discourses, followed by keeping abreast of the wider discourses taking place inside the arts sector and beyond. Therefore, arguably, urgencies of practice and the work that needs to be done is defined on a shifting ground and against a varied set of value systems. In relation to this, the context and site in which an organisation is based and the audience and constituencies that these conversations are supposed to support or engage with is arguably sometimes also a secondary concern. Indeed, welcoming wider constituencies, or if we are to use a different type of speak, audience development, is still in some cases something that sits within the marketing, educational or learning and sometimes public programming departments, rather than leading, supporting and defining what a programme can be. If we are to take a step back further and ask why these approaches, behaviours exist and why the subject of equity, access and inclusion is not spoken about in a sustained way, perhaps we also need to cast our eye on arts and cultural education. So here I'm thinking about art, curatorial and or cultural management courses. These conversations, of course, sit within the wider discussion of who has access and particip participation to the arts in the first place. And indeed, I can't separate any of this from how the effects of austerity and public funding policies makes all of this work harder. I wanted to outline this very loose thinking as I think we are always working within organisational structures and mechanisms that need revising or at least constantly reviewing, as by their very nature they make shifts forward and addressing structural disparity and welcoming a wider constituency difficult. I also wanted to, in a very small way, address and point towards how we still find ourselves here. But the hope lies in the fact that these structures are upheld by us and that we all have a stake in this conversation and have a role to play and we can galvanise to make changes. My experience, by my own omission, is limited and I'm still in a place of learning and understanding how I hardwire these conversations into my own work and practice and become a support structure and ally both to artists and cultural workers as both an educator and curator working within organisations and outside. Having worked with a number of organisations and on independent projects, I can only talk in real concrete ways by giving maybe three examples. Two of the examples I'm about to give are of work that took place whilst I was working in, an, an organi in the organisations, but I was not directly involved in the work. The first being at Camden Arts Centre. Camden Arts Centre's engagement with 
and work with artists and Romadink as part of an education program led by the head of education, Gemma Wright, involved ongoing sustained support from Action Space and Camden's teams. The programme that was developed for Andrew was led by the needs and the development of the artists. Staff worked from a place that Andrew already had an established and rich practice and resources and support was tailored to his journey. In essence, Andrew was given agency and his artwork was presented on an equal footing as the rest of the programme for a residency and showcase in 2019. Andrew was also someone that all staff got to know, like every artist the centre worked with. A structure was therefore established which allowed his work to be foregrounded but was also guided by Gemma Wright who had a more embedded understanding of a culture, behaviour and constituencies the organisation was engaged in. Wising Art Centre, I worked there in 2019. In readiness for joining the DASH programme, Wising conducted an audit of their site to understand the work that needed to be done with an understanding that the work would be ongoing to review and rethink access. Alongside this, Wising provided training to their staff to understand where each of them were with their sense of sort of how these conversations were urgent and what help they all needed in order to support a residency. More broadly, they looked to make changes on their websites and thought about access to online events. So this being an example of how they try to take a whole organisation approach, knowing if any infrastructure is changed, it needs to be with, upheld by the staff and that investment is needed in this type of work. I'd say what I saw from Wising's approach to how they worked with artists was not only that of an advocate, but an ally. This is pe best, perhaps best illustrated for seeing firsthand how feedback from artists had a direct impact on the organisation or the organisation's operations and in relation to access, inclusion and um, diversity, they were constantly in a reflexive space of learning and reviewing. Lastly, I want to talk about TERF projects and their commitment and work for their constituencies. When as part of my curatorial collective down projects in 2019 or 2020, when we presented the online exhibition present state examination an online exhibition featuring work by Louisa Martin, Bella Milroy and Jennifer Scott exploring the social, cultural, interpersonal, political conditions surrounding the perception and treatment of psychological, physical and neurological in illnesses. That's a mouthful. TERF provided us as guest curators the parameters within which to frame this exhibition for their constituency. They also provided the support structures to their audiences to access and process the exhibition and its themes with a thought for the aftercare that might be needed as a result of spending time with work, which could be described as traumatic. In conclusion, supporting artists and curators' voices, ideas and work to come forward is important to do on their own terms. The process also requires an organisation to be um, vulnerable and understanding the limits of its capabilities, growing within this understanding and holding a space collectively that they may feel uncomfortable in. OK, thank you. Thanks, Amin Pritt. So there's definitely some uh, common themes which are coming up there. And one of the things that you've just said, Amanda, was about listening and equity. And that ties in with me for um, what Morag was saying about empathy and then about who, who's being represented, who's being listened to, and tying that up with, with agency and also going back to you again, Raman, Raman, it was a, the reflexive nature of, of practice and culture. So I was just wondering if you could um, just expand on that briefly or, or thinking about how do we change the notion of like that educational structural stuff and the notion of gatekeepers and kind of seed our power as gatekeepers, as CEOs to you know, to, to, to a much more wider constituency that then has agency and not only is actively included by the organisation, but feels included and has that autonomy to, you know, to embed that, that culture of change. I know that's a very long question. Perhaps you could come to that more, Ag. Could you just say that the start of that again, because I, my internet went a bit unstable, so I missed a bit of what you were saying. So maybe somebody else could, either you could repeat the start. I was, I was just recapping. 
I was just recapping on the nature of empathy and agency right. and reflexiveness right. and okay. the embeddedness of structure and how can CEOs seed that or the people in power seed that power to open those gates right. and include yeah. people in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, it is that intention, isn't it? It's setting that intent um, and that commitment. And it's it's not just an organizational commitment. I think it's as Manfred is saying, it's it's that embeddedness across the whole organization. Um, and, and then modeling that. Um, and it's not it's not a tick box sex size it's you know you have to be really committed to the time and the change that it takes and I know that um you know I certainly in my career we haven't always got it right um and as as when I was the, the chair of the core at Corby and on the board at Rotherham Dengate we certainly could not be held up as models of best practice in terms of being you know opening the gate to to increasing diversity although you know we did have a strategy and we tried but there's a commitment there and I would say, you know, at the Traverse, we've got a strategy um, for how to do this. Again, it's about that kind of training, conversations across the team, but it's also about everybody that's on the team and on the board taking personal responsibility for this. So I think that's, you know, it doesn't, it's not good enough just to kind of sit behind the organisation. You know, it is that, you know, as I was saying, you know, what power do we each have and yeah. what are we accountable for? You know, and I think there's being on a personal mission to make change as well as an organisational mission to make change um, feels important. Thank you. Does anybody want to come back on that? Richard and then Mike. Just to, um, to follow up on that, really, I think there's too often a culture of being sort of passive, waiting for challenges and then responding to them and what I hear from my fellow panelists is a, a need to flip that to be proactive to be explicit as well like visible and transparent about our commitment so stating that publicly so we can be held to account and developing an ongoing sustained approach to this kind of work so it, it moves away from being responsive and minimum compliance towards a proactive culture of trying to address and dismantle inequalities in a much more systemic way. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say hi to Sarah Wajid. I hope I pronounced your name right, Sarah, but Sarah's the uh, new co-CEO at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in Birmingham. And I guess Sarah's an example of a gallery taking a big um, openness to making the change at the top for having us in fact there's two CEOs of both from uh, black backgrounds and that that is a big step for who's usually running sort of big regional museums and that that can't help but change what goes on in the museum so instead of fiddling around at the bottom and making minor changes that don't have an impact is go to the top Aidan, and I, I just wanted to kind of add, and um, in some ways it kind of um, in a very light way responds to what Joanna um, Holland has um, raised around um, small arts organisations and sort of um, larger, well-funded organisations. There is something here which I pointed to in what I was saying, which was around the sort of mechanisms of and the structures of organisations, I'd, you know, maybe even go, go so far as saying some of them aren't fit for purpose anymore and why do we um, with, you know, uphold these um, structures. So there is lots of work to be done um, on that level as well, but this work can happen simultaneously and it happens by pushing the voices um, or foregrounding the voices of artists, curators and cultural um, workers. But, I, you know, I think that has to be addressed at the same time um, as well. And it's true that a lot of the heavy lifting is being done by um, smaller arts organizations um, and that needs to shift as well. Yeah, I think, so Joanna Holland is asking a question or, um, and one of the points she makes is that there's a disparity between 
big organizations and small organizations with less resources and that making uh, making the program accessible and inclusive would use all the budget or a sizable part of that but um on a personal level, I'd, I think I would like to counter that because I don't think all access and inclusion needs to cost any money. And some of access and inclusion, and obviously this isn't, it's not my place to say really as a chair, but some access and inclusion is just about being a good host and being a good host doesn't cost anything. Um, and that's, a, I think that's a, a discussion yeah. for another time about making things more accessible without spending yeah. the family silver. Um, Jazz Morton, if, as I can evidence yeah. from personal experience, disabled people are regularly given flimsy excuses around level of experience when applying, interviewing for work, we can do easily and are experienced in, how can we ever get into roles like curation or production in which we could begin to change access and participation in the arts? It's minority groups that will be bent on change, not abled curators. Does anybody want to respond to that? Um, I, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I was at a, a webinar last week and Doreen from Warwick Arts Centre was talking about exactly this, actually. And, you know, she was saying that unless we as the gatekeepers, you know, make a better effort to include more diverse voices, we'll, those institutions will largely become irrelevant. Um, and she was talking, you know, she, she gave the example of, of Jay-Z and, uh, and making music and being largely ignored by the mainstream kind of music establishment and, did, and went and did his own thing. And, you know, that, that you know, the, the, the logical conclusion, I guess, will be that people will make, you know, if people aren't having access to institutions, they will do their own thing and make their own structures that are more inclusive and more accessible. Um, and that meet diverse voices and, and meet people's needs where they are. Um, so I think, you know, for those people who work in institutions, there's a real responsibility to be relevant and to be, and to reflect the people that, that you serve. Mm. Mike, did you want to come back? Yeah, I just wanted to say, it, you're totally right, Jazz. It's frustration is with a capital F, if not worse than that, is I think what probably most diverse artists experience of feeling excluded. And how that's going to change, I, it's going to be a slow process. And I think it's for us within arts organisation, it's building up groups of allies and and through that sort of power of, becoming a group and having more influence, then we can start to force change. Because I think that's probably the truth, true is that force is gonna to have to be used in the sense of um, it's not gonna, maybe reasoned argument is better than force because it's a little bit violent. I'm not leading it that way, but I feel like it's not gonna happen by smiles and nods and simple little maybe strategies. I think it's gotta be through a, a commitment to change. And I think that's got to be one that will be through institutions from top to bottom. Yeah, but as Morag says, it's got to be meaningful and authentic as you know, as well, I think. And um, we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. I really enjoyed Amanfred's comment about vulnerability. I wonder if any of the panelists have any thoughts about what function reflexes it reflexivity has in curatorial processes, i.e. how important is the capacity to acknowledge mistakes and make relevant changes to successful and meaningful curation? Can you think of any examples where this has played out successfully? And I, I just want to say how refreshing it was, Morag, to hear you say, we didn't get it right. And, and then we tried again. And I think, you know, there's this fear of failure and that, you know, it's better to try and fail and learn. I guess that's part of the reflexiveness, but yeah. So that was refreshing and thanks Morag. So any comments on that question about reflexive vulnerability, reflexiveness? 
I mean, I think, Aidan, we just need to be more honest with our sharing. I think the way that um, the way that we've been professionalised and the way that um, sort of um, teams and organisations are set up and in part sort of because of funding as well, we do talk about challenges, but it's also it's always done in a very productive way. So, you know, again, language features in this. And I think what we you know, we talk about steering groups, advisory groups, they all also have a very kind of particular outcomes that they're kind of adhering to. So I think this kind of more vulnerable space where we share and foreground that or say it's important, you know, that really hasn't been, I wouldn't say achieves the wrong word, but we haven't given that enough space. So I think, I think that type of sharing, and I don't know sort of you know the best way to do that or how you know how we go about that but it's it's those type of more informal spaces where yeah kind of peer-led sharing is needed and i think again this is kind of linked to vulnerability like for some reason organizations feel that they might be able to do that with who they might consider their peers um but yeah it's not being done in a sort of um yeah a readily way that I can see, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Maybe it is. Thank you. And I guess part of that is how do we make ourselves vulnerable, but keep ourselves safe mm. as well. So we've got a question from Eleanor Morgan. I've been fueled by Richard's work as an academic. I'm wondering about the panel's thoughts on how to effectively share and document change for the future. How do we sediment the knowledge for future generations to learn with and from? I think that might be cement, the knowledge, rather than sediment, but Richard. Yeah, thanks very much for that. I mean, I'm sort of lucky in a way that, um, you know, I'm in a research centre, just actually taking up the last couple of questions. Reflexivity, uh, the, the space to be vulnerable and to reflect is built into all of our research collaborations with cultural institutions. That's how we have to operate. And everywhere we would, every organization we would work with says, this is like an amazing opportunity to just get off the production treadmill and have that space and time to reflect. So I count myself very lucky that I get to be part of those. And the other side of that, that Ellen has kind of picked up is that as a research center, our role is to capture and generate and then share these new insights. You know, we have a commitment to put learning, distilled learning from all of our projects, open access on our website. We try and share them as widely as possible. And I think that kind of um, culture of sharing is important, but that's coming from quite a particular view that I have in the research center. I'm not sure the sector more widely is as, um, is, is as set up to do that kind of uh, shared learning that you've identified. Does anybody else want to come back on um, documenting? Well, maybe, maybe I will, look, given, given the nature of my role within this programme, <laughs> um, because we, we have, you know, obviously, through this programme, been documenting, but actually, you know, one of the things we haven't done as well as we could have done and that, you know, we should think about for next time is, is how we share that learning more widely with the sector you know, as, as part of a formative process. So I think there is definitely something about, you know, committing to, to sharing, whether it's blogs and vlogs on Medium and on Disability Arts Online. You know, we've done quite a bit of that, but I mean, how do we get that, more, you know, disseminated more widely and have a, you know, have a, a strategy for doing that? So I think you're absolutely right, Richard, that, it, that we don't share and th that there's also, uh, well, we don't share widely enough um, and picking up an Amrit's point about um, the way that our institutions are set up and the way that we're funded and it's set up, you know, in a, a competitive way, maybe rather than a collaborative way. So we don't necessarily admit to our failures as much as we could have done, whereas failure is actually just learning and it's sharing learning. And in, in many ways, I would rather that evaluation was called capturing learning than, than called evaluation. Mike? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the vulnerability one and how making mistakes is really important for learning. And 
I thought in that, that first webinar, I can't remember her name now from the Wellcome Institute, the curator from there, but the collective working providing support clearly means that is provides you that sort of safety net. You're not in this exposed position where if you make a mistake, you feel like the world's tumbling around you. You're supported by people more experienced or maybe less experienced. Um, yeah, that's really what I wanted to say on that. Thanks. I, th I think you're referring to Teresa Cisneros mm -hmm. from uh, Welcome. Yeah, can get, can, and I think there's also something there about leaders of organisations being willing to show their own vulnerability and, you know, to, to talk from their lived experience as well, you know, as well as, as kind of... Oh. I think we've just lost more rag. Um, hopefully she'll be able to come back. So today is we also have coming up next, we have the launch of the for the next cohort. And I'm going to come to you, Mike, to do that in a moment. But I'm just wondering, and so our discussion is a lot shorter today than it normally would be. And so I apologize for that. I was just wondering if any of the panelists have any closing comments that they would like to make before we move on to Mike for the launch. Is that an, Richard? Uh, just very briefly, I think um, one of the things I take away from all of this and responding to one of the uh, questions in the chat is let's try and move away from kind of slotting disability and disabled people's perspectives into organisations as some kind of accommodation and add on and instead aim for that transformation of an organisation that is a genuinely inclusive, equitable and welcoming host. It takes work, but it feels like that's the ambition we should aim for. Thanks. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make a final comment? I think I would echo that and let's, you know, let's look at all our multiple identities that we bring, look at the selves that we bring to, to work, to our practice. Um, and and absolutely embrace all of that and not um, not have divisive diversity. Um, just to um, echo Morag, it's an inter intersectional approach that's um, needed um, that you know also needs to be constantly reviewed, I would say, because you know we're living in a sort of fast changing kind of world and I think that's only going to accelerate so we need to yeah be reflexive and responsive as well. Thank you. We're just getting to that point where um, it becomes much more interesting as we begin to unpeel the onion. But unfortunately today, um, we have to stop the, the discussion there. So thank you to the panel. I'll come back and thank you properly later. But now it's over to Mike Laywood, who is going to launch the next call out for the the cohort of institutional hosts for the dash network mike thanks aiden and um i'm really really proud to be here to launch the next round of the future curators program this has been something uh coming for quite a few years but before i start talking more about it we made a short promotional film that film was made by zai holloway who's a disabled filmmaker with voiceover by Cadicia Howe, who's a disabled artist, and Rinku Barpaga, who's a deaf actor, who's providing the BSL. So, Joe, if you could just put the film on. Should I carry on, Aiden? Oh, no, here we go. Great. The Future Curators Programme. Welcome to our call-out video for the next round of curatorial residencies. Since 2018, Dash and our three partners, Mac Birmingham, Mima, and Wising, have each had a disabled curator in residence. This programme has had a great impact on the disabled curators, the hosts, and the wider sector. And now is the time to build on this success and take the residencies to the next level. 
The Future Curators program will involve the three present partners and three new partners beginning 2023 to 2026. We are inviting galleries across England to apply to be part of this opportunity and be part of a growing dynamic network of galleries, disabled curators and DASH. To find out more, visit www.dasharts.org. The closing date for Expressions of Interest is Monday the 6th of September. Thanks for watching this video and we look forward to seeing your application. Okay, shall I carry on now, Aidan? Okay, so back in 2018, when we were devising the programme, we had high hopes we could influence the sector and our hopes have been paid back a hundredfold. The partnership and network which leads the programme is an active group of curators, artists, evaluators and DASH. The philosophy behind this network is a belief in collective and cooperative working that leads us all further than competition. The network has been instrumental in the program, having a much broader influence than the three galleries and curators. Here we are today looking to expand the network to include three new galleries who will join our present partners to take the next round of residences to new heights and influences. We have wanted to keep the application process as straightforward as possible on a program of this scale, it still has to be a number of questions you've got to answer. But I hope you find the process useful and not onerous. And I realise between July, August, and you could ruin your summer. So we really hope it doesn't ruin your summer. That would be very backwards for what we want to do. So on the DASH website, earlier on, the details of where to go are all the details of the programme. There's frequently asked questions, the programme budget, draft partnership agreement and a link to the submittable application forms. Um, so if you go to www.dasharts.org and go to curators. What is the financial input is ex which is expected from each partner? Well, it's going to be £35,000, but included in that £35,000, you will see the full details in the budget on our website. There's, but there's 10,000 for a curated show, or project by the resident curator, 5,000 training budget, 5,000 for a disabled young artist project and the evaluation of the programme. So I would expect a lot of these costs would be in your 2023, 2026 budget. We are expecting a high level of submissions. We hope to see an application from your organisation. It's important you know that this is open to galleries, organisations across England. I'm sorry, it's not possible for us to work with organisations in Wales or Scotland as it's Arts Council England funded, but it isn't open to just MPOs. All you have to do is show us how you can bring that financial input in. And for all you budding disabled curators out there, we expect the call out for the six new future curators to be happening from the end of 2022. So you have to be patient. I personally am available to be contacted with any questions you may have between now and the closing date. And you can contact me on mike.dasharts.org. That's on our website as well. And one important thing that came to me today was that what made the difference in selecting Wising, because Wising came into the programme late, was when we interviewed Wising, Donna, Donna Linus is the director then, her emphatic answer when asked who would be the line manager, and she said me. And there was no arguing with Donna on that. And it was so clear that the curator would be 100% supported at YZ. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And then that just leaves me with um, to say thank you to the panelists, Morag, Mike, Richard, and Manfred for their contributions, and to Rachel, Jenny, and Joanne. The curating institutional change events have been made possible through Art Fund and Arts Council England. And just a reminder of the web address, it's www.dasharts.org for information about how to apply. So thank you for all your questions. Thank you for attending. And once again, thank you to a brilliant panel.